everyone, and welcome to our service here at Northwest Bear United Church. It is Sunday, March the 14th. We, of course, film the service on Thursday, but I know that the clocks spring forward this weekend, so I'm curious to see how many people are, are watching this live and how many people might be watching this an hour from now, um, which is kind of great about doing our services this way. You can pick the time of day that you want to, uh, to watch. So whether you're watching it live or watching it later, really glad to have you with us this week. This Sunday also marks a year since our last service here together, with a, at least with a full church. It's certainly hard to believe. And next week in the service, we're going to take some time to kind of honor the year that we've had. As Lent continues, so does our, or so do our random acts of kindness. And again, I appreciate people sending me their stories as to just simple, small things that they're doing to um, brighten somebody else's day. So I'd like to just begin with a, uh, an email that Nancy Sutton, who is a member here at Northwest, uh, sent me. This was her story and, and her act of kindness. She writes, I went into the Salvation Army to drop off some donations and was given a coupon to spend $25 and get $10 off. I was watching people while I was there, and there was a woman who came in and was looking around, picking up things and putting them down. So I went over to her and I said, I think you could use this coupon. She replied, thank you, you've made my day. There are a couple of things I wanted, but I couldn't afford them right now. That's a great story of random act of kindness, so thank you for that, Nancy. I'm continuing doing uh, my little thing each week as well, so I invite you to watch the next installment of that. So, hi everyone. Um, we are off on our adventure for our random act of kindness and uh, filming this on Thursday. And today, uh, of course, is the anniversary of the start of the pandemic. So when I think back over the year, I think of how much, uh, so many workplaces were disrupted, um, including right here at Northwest. And we had to quickly adapt to uh, how we did services, how we ran the office, how we ran the church. And uh, I'm so grateful to the, the staff that I work with who made all of that happen. So I thought on this day, Thinking of what we've all been through over the past year, it would be great to do a random act of kindness for our, my fellow staff members, our fellow staff members. So I've got a little bunny, pre-Easter gift, and we're gonna go um, to uh, their homes and drop these off. They don't know we're coming. We're just gonna leave them on the doorstep and hopefully brighten their day a little bit. So we're, our first stop is Catherine. And uh, Catherine started her job literally a week before the pandemic started and so she had to start working and learn a whole new job from home while the church was shut down anyway over the years she's become a great part of our, our team and uh, has done a wonderful job uh, getting through and adapting to these times so we'll go and leave her a little treat our next stop is uh, amanda our music director and uh Amanda, again, had to change her way of doing things very quickly. She, she still picks the hymns every Sunday, gets all the special music, but she's also got into a lot of editing. A lot of the projects we did this year, she was editing. Um, if you like the graphics for every uh, hymn that we have, again, that's Amanda for Go Now in Peace. Uh, that's Amanda as well. So again, she's just adapted and done a wonderful job. So we'll go and give this to her. We're at uh, Chris's house, and Chris is our choir director, and boy did Chris ever come to Northwest at the right time. Um, what we discovered when the pandemic hit was that Chris also has a background in computer studies, and uh, he's been able to not only do a lot of the editing, um, but he was able to set up the whole system for live streaming, um, including building the computer that we're using the live streaming for. So um, we found that he had a whole other skill set that's been amazing during this time. So not only is he a good musician, but he's a good IT guy as well. So let's go and uh, get this to Chris. So uh, we're at uh, Lori's house, my house too. And uh, um, Lori as well had to uh, uh, adapt when, um, when the pandemic started, um, no longer having in-person Sunday school. Um, for a while she was doing a virtual Sunday school and, uh, and now uh, every Sunday when our church service is over, she connects with some of the kids on, uh, on a Zoom uh, Sunday school class and they 
share stories and, and music and, and connect that way. So um, also she's had to, to, to adapt and, and has done a great job of doing so. So I'm going to leave this at her place and uh, where the guy who lives here really needs to take down his Christmas decorations. Right. Almost done. We're at uh, Sharon's house now, and Sharon is our youth coordinator. Um, and once again, you know, everything changed for her, and uh, she was, uh, but she's still been able to keep the youth together through Zoom calls and through hikes and through various activities, uh, which has been great. And then she's also taken over a lot of our uh, our editing, and uh, she's the person behind the camera every Sunday uh, filming the service. So has also used a whole different skill set. A lot of the drive-by ideas too have come from Sharon. So uh, really appreciated how she's. She's adapted to the new situation as well, so we'll go and leave this for Sharon. Here we have Darlene. Darlene is our, uh, our, our caretaker, our cleaner, and uh, she's done an amazing job of keeping this place clean, especially uh, you know when COVID first came out and we had so many protocols we had to go through, and, and she was on top of all of it all the time um, and has done a really, really good job of uh, keeping this place looking great. So. We're going to go and uh, celebrate Darlene. Well, there you have it, our awesome staff at Northwest and uh, so grateful um, for all the work they've done and all the work they continue to do to get us through this time. And we're all just super excited for when we can finally uh, all be together again. So thanks for watching. So these have been really fun to do. And again, we've got a couple more weeks left uh, of Lent. So lots of time to get your uh, random act of kindness done. And again, if you feel like sharing it, um, I'd love to, uh, to hear it. And then uh, if you're okay with it, I'd love to be able to pass it on as well. So let's uh, begin with our celebrations. I do have one birthday announcement and that's from Marlene Gladney. And she celebrated her birthday uh, last Friday, March the 12th. So happy birthday to uh, Marlene. And to everyone in our congregation who comes from an Irish background, or maybe if you just like Ireland or you like the color green, I'd like to wish you a very happy St. Patrick's Day coming up. How can you tell if a leprechaun is having a good time? He's doubling over in laughter. It's a dad joke. Um, just a few, I need people to get back here so they can actually laugh at my jokes, because this is really, really hard to do. Okay, enough of that. Um, let's talk announcements. So just, uh, just a couple this week. Um, thank you to everybody who joined our discussion last week, uh, last Wednesday, on the movie The Social Dilemma. It was really it was a great discussion. I'm going to be doing one more movie for this Wednesday, and the movie is called The Two Popes. And again, you can find it on Netflix. So if you'd like to watch the movie this week uh, and then join us for the discussion, it's going to take place again on Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m., and uh, you can find the sign-up link on Northwest, or Northwest News. Also, thanks to everybody who keeps posting pictures of the 40 photos in 40 days. Um, there's some really good ones out there. So the words for this week, again, they're in Northwest News, but in case you, you um, missed it or you don't get it, the words are surprise, hidden, shine, feel, listen, laugh, and grow. And once again, all the details on how to post them and how to see them are, is found in Northwest News. Also, this week, we're starting again the midweek conversation group, The Big Question. Uh, it was so popular, we decided to, to try it again. Um, so it's going to be on a different day, however. So it's going to take place on Wednesday mornings instead of Thursday. So Wednesday morning at 10.30. Again, all are welcome, a chance to just get together and just talk about or discuss the question of the, the week, which will be sent to you ahead of time. So if you'd like to join, all the details again are in Northwest News. As I say every week, you don't get Northwest News, you're missing out. So please call the office, uh, send an email, and let us know, and we'll make sure you're getting that uh, every Thursday. Okay, I invite you to listen to the words of the call to worship. Today we change the clocks, a sure and certain sign that spring is on the way. Longer evenings, greener grass, Bird songs are all on the way. And so we have hope, which is the essence of faith. A persistent, bright, inspiring hope, inviting us to be open to the gifts and opportunities of every day. 
So come to worship with a smile. Come to worship with a joyful heart. Come to worship with a hopeful spirit. For God's spirit is in our midst, restoring, renewing, and re-energizing all of life. Come, let us worship. I have no idea what the opening hymn is. So this will be a nice surprise for me too. But I know you'll love it. So uh, let's listen now. I invite you to please join me in our opening prayer and uh, let us pray. We know by the gospel story, God, how Jesus would always meet people in their hurt and their need. And so in, do, in so doing, he turned their despair into hope, their sorrow into joy, their anxiety into peace, and their fear into an awareness of your presence. He sought people out, listened to their stories, whether stranger or friend, and in turn gave them the gift of understanding. May the music and message of worship speak to us today and in all the coming days of Lent. For we too need a healing hand, inner strength, and the quiet confidence that we are not alone. We, too, have a story of faith to share. May this time of worship bring to our hearts peace and hope. Amen. Special music today is going to be um, sung and played by Dave and Trish. And it is, uh, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, which is one of our hymns. And it's actually a hymn based on the uh, Bible reading and the message today. So... Everything kind of connects in. So I enjoy uh, Dave and Trish. <laughs> i 
so Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Oh, look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. Thank you to Dave and thank you to Trish. We're now in week four of the Lenten Challenge program, The Preacher, in which I invited people to send me ideas for sermons. We've had a couple of pretty heavy ones the last uh, two weeks. We talked about prayer and about suffering. So I'm going to go a little lighter this week. Julie Robson, who is a member here, sent me an email a while ago telling me how much she liked the story of the woman at the well. So let me share with you her email. I've always liked the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. It's a story of Jesus being weary and what he did to obtain the rest his body and mind required. It also showed his disciples the opportunity that no one should be excluded from love. We all need rest and need to look for opportunities that show up even when we're tired or discouraged. So thank you, Julie, for the challenge of this story. I, I hope you don't mind. I am going to go in slightly a, a different direction today. But just as you said, this is very much a story about love and about inclusion, which is what I want to talk about. It's also a story about meeting strangers. So today I want to talk about love and strangers. So let's listen to uh, a little part of the story. It's taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Now, Jesus and his disciples left Judea and started back to Galilee. They had to travel through Samaria. So they came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. His disciples went on ahead to buy food. As he sat there, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman was shocked and said to him, How is it that you, a man and a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, But you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water rushing up to eternal life. The woman said, Please, Give me some of this water. Then Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, 
You're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. The woman said to him, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Jesus said, You must look to the future, for there you will find the fulfillment of your faith. Just then the disciples came back. They were astonished that he was speaking to a woman. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Amen. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. On a rainy night, a husband and wife were awakened from their bed at 3 a.m. by somebody pounding on the door. The husband went downstairs, opened the door, and there was a man standing there, a man he'd never seen before. The man at the door said, uh, excuse me, sir, will you give me a push? Are you crazy, said the guy? It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's raining outside. And he slammed the door shut. Goes back up to bed, and his wife asked him who it was. I said, just some guy looking for a push. And did you help him, asked his wife? No, it's 3 a.m., and it's pouring with rain. Well, said his wife, you have a short memory. Remember a few months ago we broke down and those two strangers helped us out? I think you should be ashamed of yourself. Remember what our face says, we have to love the stranger. So the man feels guilty and says, all right, and he gets up and he pulls on his boots and his raincoat and goes outside and says into the darkness, hello, are you there? Yes, the voice says back. Do you still need a push? Asked the man. Yes, came the reply. Well, where are you? asked the man. Over here, he said, on the swing. <laughs> what do you think of strangers? You never know what you're going to get. You know, as kids, we're always taught not to talk to strangers, and of course, for good reason. But then as we get older and more discerning about people, we can talk to strangers. And when we do, that joke aside, we can discover that sometimes some of our best conversations actually take place with unknown people in unexpected places. Maybe in an elevator, or in line waiting to get your groceries checked out, or at a bus stop, or maybe in a waiting room. If we dare to go beyond a polite smile and a, a non-committal good morning, and actually engage with someone, we can actually learn a lot. A couple weeks ago, I was standing in line uh, waiting for my groceries to be checked out, and I overheard the guy behind me on his phone, and he had an English accent. So when he was done, I just turned around and mentioned that I'd, I'd heard him speak and that uh, I was guessing he was from England, and I said, well, I'm from England as well. And so we started to talk. And I discovered that not only was his name also Phil, but he grew up in the same town in England where my grandfather lived. Not only that, but he lives two blocks away from where I live here in Barrie. I'm thinking, great, I found a new friend. And then he said to me, he says, do you like football? Which, of course, we call soccer over here. I said, yeah, I said, I love, I love football. I'm a huge Manchester United fan. And he said, oh, really, he said. Well, I'm a huge Manchester City fan. And that's when it just all fell apart because Manchester United fans and Manchester City fans just can't get along with each other. It's like cats and dogs. Have you ever struck up a conversation with a stranger that made you thankful that you did? You found points of reference, or maybe you made a connection. It's neat when that happens. And I sometimes wish it could happen more. And I know talking to strangers is not everyone's cup of tea, and I know that it doesn't always work out. I once commented to a woman who was wearing a Leaf shirt, I said, uh, you know, it's nice to see a fellow fan. And she looked at me and she said, this is my husband's shirt, I hate the Leafs. <laughs> well, good morning to you too. Not all conversations work out the way we want them to. But sometimes when we take a chance, go beyond our fears or our shyness, and reach out, 
Sometimes it is really neat or amazing where it comes back to us. Brings me to one of my favorite stories about the most unique communion service ever. Young medical student who had to be away from his fiance for a month to take his comprehensive exams in his last year of college was uh, at a bus station. This was agony for him to be separated from the person he was going to marry. He was sad and depressed. He was on a bus traveling from Ithaca, New York to New Haven, Connecticut, and the bus stopped at a Greyhound station, a rather dreary place. He sat down on a revolving seat at a dirty counter. The counter was U-shaped, so he found himself sitting across from an, an old woman. She saw him and she said, honey, you sure do look depressed. He said, I am. And before he knew it, he was crying. The woman reached across the lunch counter to pat his cheek with a dirt under the fingernail hand and he pulled away when he saw it. She simply asked, what's wrong? And he told her about his fiance and how much he loved her and how much he missed her. He showed the woman her picture. The woman said, oh, she's certainly a beautiful woman. Then she began to tell him that she'd been married to a traveling salesman who'd since passed away. She related how they used to weep, both of them, each time he had to go away, but how happy they were when he returned. She said to him, marriage is wonderful. You're going to have a good marriage together. Everything's going to be okay. The man felt better. And then she suggested he might feel even better if he had something to eat. So she ordered a donut from under the scratchy plastic cover. The woman took the donut, broke it, and gave half to him. As she did, an announcement came over the loudspeaker and said, and she said, oh my goodness, my bus is here, and she disappeared. Only then were his eyes opened, and he recognized the spirit of hope and the spirit of love in the breaking of that donut with a stranger. He knew he just shared a communion that he would never forget. William Butler Yeats famously said, there are no strangers in life, only friends we haven't met. Or you, maybe you prefer this quote on strangers by Dave Letterman. He once said, people say New Yorkers can't get along. That's not true. The other day I saw two New Yorkers, complete strangers sharing a cab. One took the tires on the radio and the other took the engine. And that's why I love the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. Because it's talking about strangers. Interesting fact. This story in the Bible is actually the longest conversation recorded in the Bible that Jesus had with any single person. And what comes out of this conversation is really interesting. It gives us a glimpse into what Jesus was really all about. And what this kingdom of God was all about that he kept referring to. Let's set the stage. Jesus and his disciples are on their way somewhere when they have to pass through Samaria. And they come to a well, not just any well, but a famous well steeped in history and tradition. Jesus is tired, and he sits at the well to rest. He asks his followers to go ahead to the next town to find food. We are told that it was midday. As Jesus is waiting there, a Samaritan woman comes to the well to draw water. It's peculiar that she's alone because the custom of the day was that women would draw water together first thing in the morning. It would be a social time for them, a chance to catch up with one another. Maybe the equivalent today is soccer moms meeting at Starbucks and chatting over a latte. The fact that she was alone and that it was later in the day suggests that she was an outcast, that she'd been shunned, that she would not have been accepted at the well when the others were there, which was indeed the case, as would soon be revealed. Instead of ignoring her or texting on his phone, Jesus decides to engage with this woman, and he asks her for a drink. The woman is shocked. Why, you are a man, a Jewish man, and you are asking me for a drink? Undeterred, the conversation continues, and it's revealed that this woman has had kind of a colored history, at least for that time. 
she'd been married five times, was now living with someone who was not her husband. Scandalous. Which makes us understand the shunned part. She would have been seen as someone who was immoral, someone outside the bounds of acceptable society. Jesus would have known this, and that's what makes the story so great. Undeterred, the conversation continues, and Jesus reveals to her the gospel of love. He calls it living water. And the woman, it, said, it, it says, was so overwhelmed by this, she literally ran from the well to tell others about this remarkable stranger that she'd met and his words for life. So who was this woman? We, we don't know who she was, but there actually is an interesting legend about her. In the Eastern uh, Orthodox tradition, she's actually given a name of Fotin. It was said that she went on to become a true disciple of Jesus, spreading his message far and wide and bringing the faith to many people. Eventually, as the story goes, she was arrested and brought before the emperor, who was Nero at that time. It was said she was tortured, beaten, and in a twist of irony, executed by being thrown into a well. It's all speculation. But what this story does is in miniature, it really shows us the heart of the gospel message, which of course is love. A love so expansive, so inclusive, so complete, that nothing can stand in its way. This story shows us how much Jesus cared by ironically showing us how little Jesus cared. So bear with me as we explore together this story of love. We learn that there were three things that Jesus didn't care about in this story. Number one, Jesus didn't care that she was a Samaritan. With a modern mindset, it's hard to understand just how deep was the hatred between Jews and Samaritans. It went all the way back to the time of King Solomon. During Solomon's reign, Israel was divided into two, a northern kingdom with the capital of Samaria and the southern kingdom with the capital of Jerusalem. And although the two cities were only separated by about 35 miles, they were in separate kingdoms. Eventually, the southern kingdom was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the northern kingdom refused to come to their aid. That seeded the division and the hatred. What was political hatred soon became cultural and religious hatred as the two communities started to differ on things like which holy scripture should be followed, even which mountain was the holiest. The Samaritans believed it was Mount Gerizim. The Jews believed it was Mount Zion. Eventually, as the Jews became much more powerful than the Samaritans, they could turn that hatred into open prejudice. Laws were enacted to ban Samaritans from Jewish holy sites, to force them to, into living as second-class citizens. So by the time of Jesus, the Samaritans were a hated and marginalized group of people. Think of the implications of Jesus speaking to a woman of Samaria. I think what is so important in this is that Jesus didn't just allow her to share the same space with him. He didn't sit there quietly while she was doing her thing, and then when the disciples came back, say to them, guess what, guys? I let a Samaritan woman sit at this well with me, and I didn't even ask her to leave or anything. Instead, he entered into conversation with her. That's what changed everything. Here is a statement or a point that I want to make. Proximity does not equal intimacy. Proximity does not equal intimacy. And we can fall into that same trap too. It's so easy to say, well, my neighbor's Muslim, or I know a guy in the office who is from Iraq, or my new chiropractor is Japanese, and... No, I'm good with that. Isn't that amazing? It's great. It is amazing. And isn't it cool that we share the same space as people who are different from us? It's one of the great things about being Canadian. But still, that's acceptance by proximity. That's the first step. 
It's the next step that's the key one. Engaging with them. Engaging with the person who is other than us. The person who looks or sounds or acts differently from us. The stranger. It's when we move from proximity to intimacy, that's when the walls begin to crumble. Shared values become apparent and common ground opens up. Jesus wasn't just okay with the fact she was Samaritan, but he engaged with her in a positive way. When we do that, we build community and we foster trust. I remember when I was in Beaton, there was a guy there who bought one of the corner stores in town. I think it was Becker's back then. His name was Danny, and Danny was from India. And in a small rural town like Beaton, that was something. And I would go into the store almost every day. I had a bit of a Coca-Cola addiction back then. So I would go in and get a can of Coke, and then off I would go, and he would always smile, and we'd always exchange, you know, good morning or good afternoon. And finally one day, he, we started to talk. I can't remember if I initiated the conversation or if he initiated the conversation. But I discovered all kinds of things. I discovered he was a pharmacist. That had been his job in, in India. But he'd been up, unable to get a job like that here. And thus, he brought this store. He said that he was saving up enough money so his wife and his daughter could come to Canada. The point was, suddenly the ground shifted. There was now a bond that came out of a shared story. We ended up becoming really good friends. Everyone has a story that they're dying to share. And when we take a chance on someone, even, or especially the stranger, and let them share their story, we build intimacy. God always invites us to move from love as proximity to love as intimacy. What else didn't Jesus care about? He didn't care she was a woman. That may sound like not a big deal to us. Back then, it was a huge deal. Women were not considered citizens. They did not have rights. They were, quote, owned by their husband and his family. Clearly, this was not a factor for Jesus. He spoke with her. And by so doing, he broke down the conventions of his day. So surprising was it that it caused again the woman to say, how is it that you, a Jewish man, speak to me, a Samaritan woman? Really, though, this should be no surprise. Because Jesus, I would argue, never saw women the way convention wanted him to. He was a man well ahead of his time. His best friends were Mary and Martha. When he was crucified, the only people present to him were women. When he was raised, who did he first interact with? In the garden, a woman. But here's the kicker. In the Bible, it says that Jesus had 12 male disciples and several women followers as well. You know, one of the greatest disservices that the early church did to our faith was inject it with testosterone. It was the early church fathers who decided that because Jesus only had male disciples, only men had a right to lead the church, and women were once again subjugated as second-class citizens. Those fathers of the early church were not reading the text closely enough. Just because the women weren't named, it doesn't mean that they weren't just as valued. Could you have imagined if in the early days of the faith, the leaders had been bold enough, courageous enough, and visionary enough to claim the authority for women that I believe Jesus himself claimed? What a different arc of history we may have seen. That glass ceiling could have been shattered a long time ago. This past week, we celebrated International Women's Day. And I was listening to the radio, and the DJ said, you know, won't it be nice one day when we won't have these days because they won't be needed? And I agree, but we're not there yet. We need these days to raise our awareness, 
and to empower those who struggle to find their power. You know, in an interesting survey done, and this is a Canadian survey, they asked men and women if they thought that women had achieved equality with men in life. 60% of men said they had. Only 22% of women said they had. That says to me that work still needs to be done. We need to keep holding up strong female role models for our young girls to aspire to. We need to make space for women to exercise leadership in the highest offices of our land. We need to stop labeling careers as men's work or women's work. We need to stop sexualizing our young women. A friend of mine put this quote on Facebook this week in honor of International Women's Day. She said, gender equality is not a woman's issue. It is a human issue. It affects us all. Here too, we have to move from proximity to intimacy. We need to hear the stories and the struggles of women and hear the truth that they need to share. Not assume that we know them, but listen to them. Sit by the well and listen to them. Listen to the struggles of the single mom trying to raise a family and balance a, a career on $35,000 a year. This is the story of the woman construction worker who has to work twice as hard to earn half the respect. This is the story of the woman living in the shelter to escape a violent home. It's great that we build shelters. It's great that women have access to jobs traditionally meant only for men. It's great that we extend benefits to single mothers. But isn't that in a way still loved by proximity? as important and valuable as it is, whenever we assume what someone needs based on our beliefs or assumptions, we still keep at a distance. But to love as Jesus did at that well is to invite those on the outside in. Make them part of the conversation. And it begins with listening, hearing stories, understanding needs, and that applies to everyone, groups or individuals. Instead of assuming, we need to sit at the well and listen to each other, understand each other, and learn from each other. That's what builds bonds of trust. That's what inspires change. And that is what lifts up equality and dignity. Everyone has a story to tell, and everyone deserves to be listened to. The story shows us that Jesus didn't care she was a Samaritan. He didn't care she was a woman. And finally, he didn't care that she had failed. That woman thought she was a failure. But Jesus turned her around and pointed her to a future. You are more than what you've done, he said. You are what you still have to do. No finer does love shine. No deeper does love go. No higher does love aspire than when it gives hope to someone who bears the burdens and scars and mistakes of the past by reorienting them towards their future. Love says, Stop looking in the rearview mirror of what you've done when there's a great big panoramic view ahead of you as to where you can be going. One day Mark was walking home from school when he noticed a boy ahead of him had tripped and dropped all of the books he was carrying along with two sweaters, a baseball hat, a glove, and a small tape recorder. Mark knelt down and helped the boy pick up the scattered articles. Since they were going the same way, he helped to carry part of the burden. As they walked, Mark discovered the boy's name was Bill, that he loved video games, baseball, and history, that he was having a lot of trouble with his other subjects that he'd just broken up with his girlfriend. They arrived at Bill's home first, and Mark was invited in for a Coke and to watch some television. The afternoon passed pleasantly with a few laughs and some shared small talk. Then Mark went home. 
They continued to see each other around school, had lunch together once or twice, then both graduated from junior high school. They ended up in the same high school where they had brief contacts over the years. Finally, the long-awaited senior year came, and three weeks before graduation, Bill asked Mark if he could talk to him. Bill reminded him of the day long ago when they had first met. Do you ever wonder why I was carrying so many things home that day? Asked Bill. You see, I cleaned out my locker because I didn't want to leave a mess for anyone else. I had stored away some of my mother's sleeping pills. I was going home to take my own life. I thought I was a failure and I couldn't see my future. But then you came along and everything changed. If you could like me, maybe I figured I wasn't so bad after all. You took my failures, you turned them into a future just by being, just by noticing me, a stranger, and being kind to me. I've always wanted to say thank you. No brighter does love shine, no deeper does love go, no higher does love aspire than when we give someone their future by believing in them right now. The woman at the well saw herself as a failure. Whether she was or not, that's how she saw herself. Forced to come alone to draw water, I'm sure her self-esteem was at a very low point, shunned by her community. No one cared. Until a man with a beard and kind eyes spoke to her. At first, maybe she felt threatened or worried or wondered what his agenda was. But the genuineness and gentleness of his voice soon put those fears to rest. He wanted her to know that he saw her that he knew her story, that he understood her, and he wanted to give her a message. Don't let your faults shape your future. You are more than what you have done. You are what you still have to do. Sometimes the greatest thing that we can do as bearers of the living water of our gospel is simply through kindness, to reorient someone towards their future. Friends, there are strangers in our midst with stories that need and deserve to be heard. We need to stop our rush around, our distraction sometimes, and just sit and rest and see who comes to join us. And when they do, Engage with them, listen to them, and learn from them. For that is the intimacy of living water that Jesus spoke about. It is within the intimacy of that love that change is nurtured. For when you put a face and a story to someone, you begin to care about them. And when you care about them, you only want the best for them. And suddenly, the walls begin to crumble, the boundaries begin to vanish, the distance is shortened, and living water is shared. Just as it was with Danny at Becker's, the medical student at the lunch counter, between the two boys walking home from school, or the Samaritan woman lucky enough to draw water as Jesus rested. Sometimes, friends, the way to care about them, the way to care about someone, is not to care about them. As Jesus did not care that she was a Samaritan, did not care that she was a woman, did not care that she failed. Sometimes when we don't care, we actually show just how deeply we really do. It's okay to talk to strangers. In fact, it can be a vital part of our faith experience. Take a chance, because you never know what common ground you will find. Come, sit at the well for a while, 
You just never know what living water you may share. Amen. I'd like to share a prayer, and at the end, I'm, we're going to sing together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks for this worship time that we've enjoyed as a church community, for the message which shared the wisdom of Scripture, to the music which inspires the spirit of faith, to our prayers which deepen our sense of connection, and for the love and laughter that even when separated always defines this place and creates joy within. May what we've shared and heard today be a source of light in our week ahead, that wherever there may be darkness, that we can shine with the light of hope and love. May we always have the courage of Jesus to reach out to the stranger, to make those who are other feel included and welcomed. May we always have the courage of the woman at the well to find in the encouragement of others a renewed belief in ourself. As we journey into this week ahead, journey with us, our companion of truth and grace. And this weekend, as we mark the one-year anniversary of the beginning of the pandemic, may we be deeply aware of all who have struggled this year those who've lost loved ones, those who are being sick themselves, those who've seen their business close or their jobs lost, those who work hours in hospitals and nursing homes to heal and help others, and all of us who have been affected in one way or another. This has been a year of resilience and may the resilience that's seen us through this year continue to see us through what is to come. And may hope be kindled that as we see the light ahead, we may feel encouraged to do what we have to do to get us to a better tomorrow. Continuing now in prayer, we, we offer our own prayers in the sacred silence of this moment. God who reaches out in the intimacy of love, reach out to us, filling us with the joy of the gospel, that we too, like the woman at the well, may go forth with enthusiasm to share the living water of our faith. And hear us now as together we sing the Lord's Prayer. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and being part of our service today. I hope you have a great week ahead. I would like to end with a blessing, uh, an Irish blessing, in celebration of uh, the upcoming St. Patrick's Day. There's so many to pick from. I think I've chosen lots over the years, so I tried to find one that's new. So hopefully uh, these words are. Listen now for the words of blessing. May the friendships you make be those which endure, 
and all of your gray clouds be small ones for sure. And trusting in God, to whom we all pray, may a song fill your heart every step of the way. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.